time to sit down. Well, it's so good to be here with you. I say this is my yearly visit. I, if they don't call me, I just call them and say, how about these dates? <laughs> Dave, would you stand up and let everybody see how good looking you are? <laughs> Dave and I have been married 52 years. And, um, let's just say it's been a journey. God has changed me quite a bit over those years, and he says sometimes he feels like he's been married to 20 different women, <laughs> because I change a little bit, and then he gets used to me, and then God makes me a little better, and then he's got to get used to me. So the good news is, is God's always changing us and making us better if we want to cooperate with him. Amen? Amen. We have um, our 12th grandchild is in the womb right now. And so we have four children, two son-in-laws, two daughter-in-laws, about to have 12 grandbabies, two great-grandbabies, and all I can say is it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, I have to buy something like 24 or 25 just birthday cards every year. And of course, you know, when they all get to a certain age, then they want money, just, just money. So I hope you're all doing well. and. Uh, what I want to share with you tonight, I'm going to be bold enough to say that <clears throat> it may be one of the most important messages you've ever heard. <clears throat> and it's going to be probably one of the simplest messages you've ever heard. If you're listening, and you know, you can sit here and not listen, but if you're listening, if somebody asks you tomorrow afternoon, what did Joyce preach on last night? You will be able to tell them. Don't you feel kind of foolish when somebody asks you what the message was and you go, well, it was good, but I, I don't really remember what it was. I want to talk to you about something tonight that radically, I mean, radically affected my life. And actually, I'll say that if I would not have learned this or let God teach it to me, I don't think I would be here today. When we first started our ministry, I say our own ministry, it's not our own, it belongs to God, but the, I've been in ministry 42 years, I've been teaching the word, but we've had Joyce Meyer Ministries for 32 years plus. Five years I taught home Bible studies and about 20, 25 people average each week came to that. And then for five years, I worked at a church in St. Louis and uh, learned a lot there. And then we had a word from the Lord, take your ministry now and go north, south, east, and west. Well, the problem was nobody knew us north, south, east, or west. And so we were just obedient to God, and we went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis, <laughs> and south St. Louis. Literally, you can find a way to obey God. And so it's been a long journey, and we had a big vision, but everything was little. And God spoke to my heart, three things I'm going to tell you to do, and if you do them, I'll bless your ministry. And when God spoke these three things to me, I'll be honest and say that I probably didn't fully comprehend or understand what they were. But he taught me over the next several years and still continues to teach me. He said, I want you to be a person of integrity. Be honest. Don't ever play games with any of the money that I put through your hands. Use it for what you say you're going to use it for. Be a person of excellence. Do what you do with excellence. And that's the part I'm going to talk to you mostly about tonight. Because an excellent person doesn't just do what they have to, they always go the extra mile. They always do a little bit more than what they have to do. And we don't have a lot of that in the world today. It's very difficult to get a quality job. I don't mean to go get a quality job, but to get somebody to do a quality job. It's uh, It's almost getting to be commonplace that people don't 
keep appointments. Don't, don't you just love it when you have to take off work to meet a repairman and then he doesn't show up, doesn't show up, doesn't show up and doesn't even bother to call and tell you that he's not going to show up and then you call the place and ask where he's at. Oh, he, he got behind and he's not going to make it today. And here you've taken off work for a whole day and still don't have what you needed. Well, I lived in times when people didn't do that. I was a teenager in the 50s, and, and uh, th those were pretty good times. Good in that people had morals. They still considered honor to be something that you wanted to have. People had manners. And I'm talking about even people that weren't so-called Christians had manners. Men didn't curse in front of women. I mean, if they cursed a blue streak everywhere else when they got around a woman, they didn't do it. And if they did, they apologized. And I'm glad that I lived in those days, but it really makes me sad to see how far from that we have fallen. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about the world, I'm talking about Christians as well, and not all, obviously, many of you are committed to excellence, you're great, you keep your word, you do what you say you're going to do, but there's a lot of Christians that don't, and I think it'd be pretty safe to say there's probably more that don't than those that do. And so we have to learn that we have to set the standard, not follow the standard that's already out there. We're supposed to be leaders and examples not followers. You know what Jesus said? You're in the world, but you're not of the world. In the world, but not of it. In other words, you're going to live here, but you can't be like everybody else. And so we all want to be liked. We all want to be accepted. And I can just pretty well tell you, if, if you make a really full, wholehearted commitment to God and to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you are going to have some people that are not going to want to be your friends anymore. But I'd rather be popular in heaven than to be popular here on earth. Amen? So he said, be a person of integrity, do what you do with excellence, and keep the strife out of your life, out of your ministry and out of your life. Well, we have really worked hard at maintaining those things over the last 30 some odd years. And I think that we have a really, really excellent ministry and an excellent staff. And I'm going to read you a story that I didn't get to read in the first service, just to, just to make a point. Because I believe what's on the head comes down on the body. Don't you? How many of you believe if you go in a bathroom at a restaurant and it's filthy, that it's not really a problem with the person who's assigned to clean them, it's a problem with the management? Because it's up to them to make sure that things are done right. And if they don't set that example, then people under them won't call. Now remember, an excellent person always goes the extra mile. Well, we got this letter into the office, and it just blessed me so much. I mean, for a long time, I couldn't read this without just crying like a baby, and I very rarely do that. But it said, Sarah wrote into the ministry via Facebook and said, I was sexually assaulted, and now I'm pregnant, and I'm trying to decide whether to carry the baby or abort it. The ministry replied by email with prayer and scriptures to encourage her. We then followed up a couple of days later with another email letting her know we would like to physically call her to pray with her and ask if we could have her phone number. Sarah's one sentence reply before giving her number said, I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back and are even willing to talk to me. God worked through that phone call in a miraculous way and Sarah gave her life to Christ. Now I want you to keep in mind that whoever it was that answered this email really was not required as part of her job to do anything other than answer the email. 
She wasn't going to make any more money if she went the extra mile. But because we've taught people this, and we have people who, what, what we try to get into our people is we're here to help people, not to just be a big, well-known ministry. Every person that calls in here is somebody that God cares about. And I want every piece of mail that comes into this place answered in some way, shape, or form. And if we tell somebody we're going to pray for them, then I want them to be prayed for. And so you know, there's a lot of stories I could get into, but I, this just one really blessed me. I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back. Well, God worked through that phone call in a miraculous way. Sarah gave her life to Christ. When we followed up again by email to celebrate her new life and provided links to Everyday Answers section on our website and other online resources, she responded by saying, I had been suicidal the night I felt compelled to click on your Facebook link to prayer. I had my death all planned out. Then you emailed and you emailed again. For the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now see, th th here's the thing we've got to understand. You are around people all the time out in the world. You can reach people that the few of us on the platform can't reach. And most of the people who need Christ are not coming to church to find him. But they are looking at people who claim to know him. And love should be our main theme in the church. Above everything that you study and read on, you should study on love. Because when it all comes right down to it, that's really what we're called to do, is love God, love ourselves, and love other people. Not love yourself in a selfish, self-centered way, but love yourself because God loves you. Because if you're against yourself, you're not going to really show any love to other people. You cannot give away what you don't have. So to receive God's love means that you learn to accept and love yourself. And so she said, for the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now that's just sad, but the world is full of people like that. After talking to you, I, couldn't, I could not go through with the suicide I had planned. I was still confused and certain I would be aborting the baby, but after you sent scriptures, emailed again, and called, my world changed forever. This is cool. As I prayed on the phone to become a Christian, I felt what I can only describe as a blanket of peace in my room. I know that sounds crazy, but a heavy feather-like blanket descended on me. Then when the lady who called prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit, a cool breeze swept in through my room. I have no idea what it was, but literally a breeze came in and my hair was moved by the breeze. The windows weren't open and it's 95 degrees here, yet a breeze came over me with the blanket. It was as if God was with me in the room. Is that crazy? Question mark. Because I've never experienced anything like that before. Okay, so she couldn't have been making it up because she didn't even know what was happening. But these are the things, see, the Holy Spirit can move in miraculous ways if what we're doing is really being done out of love and with the right motivation. We have to stop living to impress people and really genuinely care about them. Well, she said, now I feel like I can live and my baby will live. You showered me with love and acceptance and honestly saved my life and my baby's life. Thank you so much. I ask that you'll continue to pray as I learn who I am and begin to be a mama. Joyce Meyer Ministries has since sent Sarah a Bible and we are providing her with tickets for the Love Life Women's Conference in September. In her last email, Sarah wrote, I'm so excited to get my very own Bible. I've never ever had one before. I'm reading the scriptures that you sent and I can't get enough of them. I'm even reading them to the baby too. Now, I tell you that just as an example of what it means to go the extra mile. You see, if she didn't really care about those people contacting the ministry, then she would have just done what her job required and she would have gone no further. Like I said, she wasn't going to make any more money. 
for doing all that extra stuff. I wouldn't have even known what she did if somebody wouldn't have sent that in and then somebody by somebody by somebody by somebody got it to me. And I believe that God let me see that just to show me that we do have an excellent staff <clears throat> who genuinely care <clears throat> about people. <clears throat> you got some tree here that's called a choking tree and I think it's like, <clears throat> <clears throat> all right. So, what is strife? Strife is an angry undercurrent. It's bickering, arguing, heated disagreement, but you can have strife and nobody be yelling at somebody. And sad to say in many churches, there's strife underneath. People may come and listen to the pastor and then go eat him for lunch. Come on. The worship team sings pretty songs but several of them think they have got a better voice than the worship leader and they should be leading the worship. And so they talk about the worship leader to other people. And I'll tell you what happens if something like that is not stopped. It'll end up killing the anointing on church. And you can put on the greatest show in the world, but if there's no anointing, nothing is gonna happen in the people's lives. You know, you're not changed because we have a great media presentation and a light show. And my, my goodness, in my conferences, we have smoke machines. We've got it all. You know, it's like, whoo. But that's still not what changes people's lives. The only thing that changes life is God's anointing. And the only way we're going to have that is if we keep the strife out of our life, if we're people of integrity and people of excellence. Amen. Now, to be a person of integrity means that you're going to keep your word. Wow. Do we ever have a lot of that lacking today? I'll call you back in 30 minutes. Haven't heard back in six months. <laughs> hey, I'll call you next week and we'll go out to lunch. You don't even intend to call and you don't even want to go to lunch. It's just something to say to sound nice. Well, when God first spoke these things to me, as I said, I wasn't uh, really educated in what any of them were. And so God had to teach me. I wasn't able to go to Bible college, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And honestly, I think that's the best one to go to. And I'll tell you what, God ran me through the ringer, so to speak. You say, well, what do you mean by that? God's a good God. Yes, he's a good God, and he's good enough to spank your little royal holy bottom if that's what he needs to do. Amen? And so God taught me a lot of lessons one, I remember we were in Jacksonville, Florida, visiting a couple. I'd been preaching at their church, and, you know, we kind of hit it off with them. I still remember their names were, well, I better not say that. Well, no, it won't go on TV here. <laughs> well, they might, you, you get everywhere, so they might hear it anyway, so I better not say their names. Uh, I'm getting wiser in my old age. And so we'd had a good time, so when we got ready to leave, I said, hey, you guys ought to come to St. Louis sometime and we'll spend a, several days or a week together and we'll take you to see all the sights, you know, we'll go to the arch, we'll go to the zoo, man, we'll go out to eat, we'll just have a great time. Well, to be honest, I didn't want them to come to St. Louis. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have time to spend a week with anybody. I barely knew what my name was. I was so busy back then trying to get the ministry started. I liked them, but I didn't like them that much that I wanted them to come <laughs> and stay with me that long. And so I didn't think anything about, hey, you guys come, you know, you know, you know how we are. I mean, you know how we are. And so about two weeks went by and the man called and he said, well, we're ready. <laughs> and I said, ready for what? 
He said, well, you know, to come to St. Louis, like you said. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And so when I pretended to be happy and hung the phone up, I said to God, what am I going to do? And he said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to bring them to St. Louis. And if you don't want to keep them in your house, you pay to put them in a nice hotel and you spend the week with them. You take them wherever they want to go. You sightsee with them. You take them out to eat and you will learn not to say things you don't mean anymore. <laughs> and I'll never forget that because it really did teach me a lesson. Now, obviously, I didn't have to do what God said, but something else we're missing today that we need a lot more of is a reverential fear of God. I would venture to say that there's a fair number of people that have never heard a message on the reverential fear of God. I mean, I've, I've even had people say, well, I don't understand that. I thought, you know, God was good and he loved us and, you know, we've got grace and forgiveness. And I, don't, I don't understand what you mean. I don't think I should be afraid of God. I said, it's not that kind of fear. <laughs> It's a reverence. It's an awe for God that you know he's God and that he knows everything and can do everything and he sees everything. And see, everything we do when nobody's looking, God sees. I'm going to say that again because getting that revelation in your life will change your behavior. I mean, it honestly will. If, if we can realize that everything we do, God sees it. Come on, everything we do, <clears throat> God sees it. And if we can learn to live before an audience of one, realizing that we're here for His glory. And by the way, you know what the word glory means? It means the manifestation of all of the excellencies of God. So when we say, Lord, I glorify your name, what we're really saying is I behave with such excellence that I am making you famous. Amen? <laughs> People are watching us, and we need to realize that. No strife, be a person of integrity, be a person of excellence. The thing that frightens me today is we live now in times when one and maybe two are going on three generations are here on the earth who never grew up with these principles. They're not teaching them in school. <laughs> I mean, if when we were in school, when I was in school, if I would have done some of the things that kids do in school today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is <laughs> right. Yeah. But then, what do you expect from the kids if you've got a teacher cussing in the classroom? <clears throat> so, I, to be honest, we have a mess. And God is the only one <clears throat> that can unravel it. But we're partners with God and he gives us a part to play. And I'm hoping that the message that I'm speaking here tonight will in some way, shape or form convict every person here and all the other places that you're watching to come up higher in at least one area of your life. Just, just one area you're going to come up higher. We're going to set the standard, not follow the standard. Several months ago on one of my conferences, I taught a version of the message that I'm teaching here tonight. And one of our speakers stayed to hear me speak. And he came to me afterwards and he said, 
Now, I mean, this is a well-known speaker that's been in church all of his life. And he's a man that's probably close to 40. And he said, I have never in my life heard anything like that. And I just taught a pretty simple message on being a person of excellence. Gave a bunch of practical examples, which I'll do here tonight. And he said, can I come home and live with you for a while? <laughs> One of the reasons why I believe we do have a ministry of excellence is because we taught that to our children and our two sons are the two CEOs of the ministry. One of them runs the world missions and one runs all the other business aspects of the media and the operations and so on and so forth. Don't tell your kids one thing and then let them see you doing something else. Amen. <clears throat> Don't tell them not to lie, and then when somebody calls that you don't want to talk to, tell your kids, tell them I'm not home. <laughs> you say, oh, come on, I, I came here to hear something deep. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, this is about as deep as it gets, but it's deep enough to change your life if you're willing to go there. I think half the time we want to hear something that's so, like, over our head and sounds so amazing that we can just go out and say, wow. <laughs> but we don't even know what we heard. Well, you'll remember this one. And so, how can somebody be in church 30 plus years and never hear a message on being excellent? I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. If God wouldn't have taught me these things, I honestly don't believe that I would be here today doing what I'm doing. In 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 3, <clears throat> the Bible says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us you want to know what your calling is? Here it comes. Who called us by and to his own glory and excellence. So we are called to be excellent. First Peter 2, 9 says basically the same thing. There's a man in the Bible named Daniel that <clears throat> was an excellent man. In the very first chapter, the eighth verse, we see that he refuses to compromise. He'd made a vow to God about what he would and wouldn't eat, and they wanted him to eat all these rich, dainty foods. And he literally could have lost his life by refusing to eat those things. But he was willing to do even that rather than break his word to God. And so... God gave him favor. See, if you're willing to do the right thing, the devil is going to try to make you afraid that you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your friends, or something bad's going to happen to you if you do the right thing. But the truth is, is no matter what the devil tries to do, if God decides to promote you, you're promoted. And if God gives you favor, you've got favor. And when you have the favor of God on your life, mm -mm, some good things begin to happen. And so Daniel also had excellent friends. You've heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not compromise, even if it meant their life. And the thing is, is who you hang out with is very important because if you're around somebody enough, what's on them is going to get off on you. Amen? Amen? And some of you probably could change your life drastically just by getting a new group. I'll just leave that with you. Now, because I want this to be very practical, I'm going to get to some practical things. If you're not handicapped, don't park in a handicapped parking space. And especially don't do it at church. 
And I bet you that we've got people in here tonight that have pulled into this parking lot late, couldn't find a parking space, and you've pulled into a handicapped parking space. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, because then you'd be tempted to lie, and I don't want to be responsible for that. Well, they got too many of those handicapped parking spaces anyway. <laughs> If we'd stop making excuses for our disobedience and just call it what it is. By the way, I love you guys. There's so many scriptures that talk about this. If I had another two hours, we could go through every one of them, but... The Bible, the Bible not only says to walk in love, it says to abound in walking in love. So even if you are a fairly loving person, we can't be content there. We have to always want to grow. We have to always want to be better. Paul said, excel in giving. And he was talking to people that were givers. But he said, excel and go on and do even more in this area. The more we do of what's right, the more happy and peaceful we're gonna be, and the greater reward is gonna come in our lives. <clears throat> if you have a bumper sticker on your car declaring that you're a Christian, please don't break the speed limit Roll your window down and throw trash out of it. And make nasty signs at people. We won't explain that any further. When you use the last of the toilet paper on the roll, you're like, now you gotta be kidding me, lady. I didn't. I did not come all the way over here and fight this traffic to hear you talk about toilet paper. Well, some of you need to hear this. Oh, the next person will get it. Well, but don't you hate it when you go into a bathroom and there is no toilet paper on the roll? So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And listen, if you don't need this, I'll preach to myself because I need it. When I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I am so sleepy. And I realize that when I use the little bit of toilet paper on that roll, that there's going to be none left for Dave when he gets up. And because I love God, I replace the toilet paper. <laughs> See, instead of just telling God we love him, we need to start acting like we do by being the kind of person he wants us to be. When you use a public restroom, do not tinkle all over the seat and not clean it up. There is nothing that annoys me worse. I have to use a lot of public restrooms because I travel a lot and I hate it when I go in. I have to go in four or five before I can find one clean enough to sit down on. Come on, is this okay? Yeah. Don't let your dog go number two on your neighbor's yard and not clean it up. When you open your car door, don't throw it open and nick the paint. Hmm. You have an excellent attitude when the clerk at the store makes a mistake and has to go back and re-ring your 45 items. Do you treat her like she's valuable and act like 
You think Jesus would act? <laughs> or do you do what I used to do? <sighs> well, now I'm going to be late for my next appointment. With my rhinestone Jesus pen flash. <laughs> Now, God taught me a lot for some reason in the grocery store. I went to the grocery store about three times a week. My kids were all little then, and we were very, very tight on money. And so I clipped every coupon that I could find where I could get any kind of a deal. Well, you know, there's fine print on coupons, but interestingly enough, until I received the Holy Spirit... I didn't read the fine print, but when you get hooked up with God, He will lead you to the fine print. <laughs> How many of you know the fine print can get you in trouble? And so I noticed, because I, I loved it when chickens were on sale. And I, it said on the coupon, which I never noticed before, limit three per family. Not even three per person, three per family. Please. Well, I did not want three chickens. I wanted a bunch of free chickens. Not free, but cheap chickens. And so I would take my kids with me. And we'd all get three chickens and all get different carts and all get in different lines and pretend like we didn't know each other. Come on, is there anybody in the house that knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so one day I was standing there and I thought, I don't think I gave my daughter enough money for tax. And my heart started pounding in fear. Now, I'm teaching this, like, 25-person Bible study in my home. And God's teaching me how to be excellent, be a person of integrity, and so on and so forth. And so, he just said to me, don't you realize if you have to do this in fear, something's wrong with it? When I got through the checkout lane, he said, well, congratulations, Joyce, you just stole three chickens. <laughs> well, the first time, or one of the earlier times that I preached this message, I was in a church in Tennessee, and the pastor sat on the platform with me, you know, behind me. So he was behind me the whole time I was preaching, and I told that story that I just told. And he jumped up and pointed to his wife on the front row. <laughs> And he said, you have turned me into a thief. <laughs> but he said, it wasn't chickens, it was toilet paper, and it was for the church. <laughs> Another thing God taught me was, you know, when you go in a grocery store, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff you really don't have to have is first. And then by the time you get over to the milk and the eggs and, you know, the stuff you really got to have, you've ran out of money, at least if you were like I was back then. I mean, I had to shop with my calculator and my coupons, and I had exactly $70 for every two weeks for groceries. And if I was going to be over that, I had to start putting stuff back. Well, until I really let God have full play in my life. Whatever I didn't want, I would take out of the cart and just put it wherever I was at in the store. You know, I'm the person who put the lettuce in the cleanser. <laughs> Do you ever find items in strange places and think, what is that? What is that? It was me. And so then God started making me. And when I say making me, he didn't like force me, but... I was committed to trying to learn to do what I felt like God really wanted me to do. So he would make me walk every item. 
You, you know how it is when, you, when the Holy Ghost is in you and you're really trying to be led by the Spirit? It's, you don't even have to have any words. It's like that look that your mother gives you. And I finally learned it was better to just go do what he said than to have it nagging at me all day. Because sometimes God can be a nag. I mean, he would just keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And if you don't pass that test, you will get to take it again. And then one last story, my grocery cart. I know that most of you have heard the grocery cart story, but you're just going to have to indulge me and let me tell it again. This is so amazing to me because, you know, I was one of those people, I didn't want to go put my grocery cart back in the space marked off for grocery carts. I wanted to lean it against a pole or prop it on the other carts that were out in the middle of nowhere. And I would kick the wheels and you know, try to get them so the thing wouldn't roll away. And you'd start to walk off and it would start to roll so you'd go back. And... <laughs> Don't you love it when you come out of the store and there's two or three grocery carts leaned against your car and one of them scratched your paint? Well, it was people like me who did that. I didn't want it done to me. But I did it to other people. So God started dealing with me to go put the thing back where it was supposed to be. Well, they've got people that do that. Well, they're asking you to do it. Then it won't cost as much to run the store. <laughs> then the prices won't be so high. But here's the sad thing. <clears throat> it took me two years. Two years. Now, we're talking this is 40 years ago. I'm grateful I can say that. But... It took me two years to get to the point where I would go put it back every single time. I started out, I'd do it if the weather was good, if it wasn't raining, wasn't snowing, wasn't cold, the wind wasn't blowing. <laughs> Am I the only one who does these kind of things? Do I have anybody else out there that feels you've been kind of caught? And, and I can say this and mean it with my whole heart. I honestly believe if I would never have learned to put my grocery cart back where it was supposed to go, I don't think I'd be here today. That's how important it is that you hear what I'm saying tonight. We need to come up higher. And we need to be excellent people who represent the God that we say that we serve and love in a way that he deserves. Somebody give God a praise tonight. How many of you will know tomorrow afternoon what I preached on tonight? All right. Has anybody thought of a, at least one area where you could maybe make a little change? Well, then I think my job is done. Let me pray for you and then Todd's going to come. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word tonight. So simple, but yet so powerful. I thank you for reminding me again of the kind of person you want me to be. And I pray, Lord, for everybody here that they heard and that they will obey. Lead and guide each person in what you would have them do to come up higher. And help them never forget how important it is. In Jesus' name. Time to sit down. Well, it's so good to be here with you. I say this is my yearly visit. I, if they don't call me, I just call them and say, how about these dates? <laughs> Dave, would you stand up and let everybody see how good looking you are? <laughs> Dave and I have been married... 52 years, and uh, let's just say it's been a journey. God has changed me quite a bit over those years, and he says sometimes he feels like he's been married to 20 different women. 
because I change a little bit and then he gets used to me and then God makes me a little better and then he's got to get used to me. So the good news is, is God's always changing us and making us better if we want to cooperate with him. Amen? Amen. We have um, our 12th grandchild is in the womb right now. And so we have four children, two son-in-laws, two daughter-in-laws, about to have 12 grandbabies, two great grandbabies, and all I can say is it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, I have to buy something like 24 or 25 just birthday cards every year. And of course, you know, when they all get to a certain age, then they want money, just, just money. So I hope you're all doing well. And uh, what I want to share with you tonight, I'm going to be bold enough to say that <clears throat> It may be one of the most important messages you've ever heard. going to be probably one of the simplest messages you've ever heard. If you're listening, and you know, you can sit here and not listen, but if you're listening, if somebody asked you tomorrow afternoon, what did Joyce preach on last night, you will be able to tell them. Don't you feel kind of foolish when somebody asks you what the message was and you go, well, it was good, but I, I don't really remember what it was. I want to talk to you about something tonight that radically, I mean radically affected my life. And actually I'll say that if I would not have learned this or let God teach it to me, I don't think I would be here today. When we first started our ministry, I say our own ministry, it's not our own, it belongs to God, but if I've been in ministry 42 years, I've been teaching the word, but we've had Joyce Meyer Ministries for 32 years plus. Five years I taught home Bible studies and about 20, 25 people average each week came to that. And then for five years I worked at a church in St. Louis and uh, learned a lot there. And then we had a word from the Lord, take your ministry now and go north, south, east, and west. Well, the problem was nobody knew us north, south, east, or west. And so we were just obedient to God, and we went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis, <laughs> and south St. Louis. Literally, you can find a way to obey God. And so it's been a long journey, and we had a big vision, but everything was little. And God spoke to my heart. Three things I'm going to tell you to do, and if you do them, I'll bless your ministry. And when God spoke these three things to me, I'll be honest and say that I probably didn't fully comprehend or understand what they were. But he taught me 
over the next several years and still continues to teach me. He said, I want you to be a person of integrity. Be honest. Don't ever play games with any of the money that I put through your hands. Use it for what you say you're going to use it for. Be a person of excellence. Do what you do with excellence. And that's the part I'm going to talk to you mostly about tonight. Because an excellent person doesn't just do what they have to. They always go the extra mile. They always do a little bit more than what they have to do. And we don't have a lot of that in the world today. It's very difficult to get a quality job. I don't mean to go get a quality job, but to get somebody to do a quality job. It's, uh, it's almost getting to be commonplace that people don't keep appointments. Don't, don't you just love it when you have to take off work to meet a repairman and then he doesn't show up, doesn't show up, doesn't show up, and doesn't even bother to call and tell you that he's not going to show up. And then you call the place and ask where he's at. Oh, he, he got behind and he's not going to make it today. And here you've taken off work for a whole day and still don't have what you needed. Well, I lived in times when people didn't do that. I was a teenager in the 50s and, and uh, th those were pretty good times. Good in that people had morals. They still considered honor to be something that you wanted to have. People had manners. And I'm talking about even people that weren't so-called Christians had manners. Men didn't curse in front of women. I mean, if they cursed a blue streak everywhere else when they got around a woman, they didn't do it. And if they did, they apologized. And I'm glad that I lived in those days, but it really makes me sad to see how far from that we have fallen. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about the world, I'm talking about Christians as well, and not all, obviously, many of you are committed to excellence. You're great, you keep your word, you do what you say you're gonna do. But there's a lot of Christians that don't, and I think it'd be pretty safe to say there's probably more that don't than those that do. And so we have to learn that we have to set the standard, not follow the standard that's already out there. We're supposed to be leaders and examples, not followers. You know what Jesus said? You're in the world, but you're not of the world. In the world but not of it. In other words, you're gonna live here, but you can't be like everybody else. And so we all wanna be liked, we all wanna be accepted. And I can just pretty well tell you, if, if you make a really full, wholehearted commitment to God and to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you are gonna have some people that are not gonna to wanna to be your friends anymore. But I'd rather be popular in heaven than to be popular here on earth. Amen? So he said, be a person of integrity, do what you do with excellence, and keep the strife out of your life, out of your ministry and out of your life. Well, we have really worked hard at maintaining those things over the last 30 some odd years, and I think that we have a really, really excellent ministry and an excellent staff. And I'm gonna read you a story that I didn't get to read in the first service, just to, just to make a point, because I believe what's on the head comes down on the body. Don't you? How many of you believe if you go in a bathroom at a restaurant and it's filthy, that it's not really a problem with the person who's assigned to clean them, it's a problem with the management. Because it's up to them to make sure that things are done right. And if they don't set that example, then people under them won't call. Now remember, an excellent person always goes the extra mile. 
Well, we got this letter into the office, and it just blessed me so much. I mean, for a long time, I couldn't read this without just crying like a baby, and I very rarely do that. But it said, Sarah wrote into the ministry via Facebook and said, I was sexually assaulted, and now I'm pregnant, and I'm trying to decide whether to carry the baby or abort it. The ministry replied by email with prayer and scriptures to encourage her. We then followed up a couple of days later with another email letting her know we would like to physically call her to pray with her and ask if we could have her phone number. Sarah's one sentence reply before giving her number said, I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back and are even willing to talk to me. God works through that phone call in a miraculous way and Sarah gave her life to Christ. Now, I want you to keep in mind that whoever it was that answered this email really was not required as part of her job to do anything other than answer the email. She wasn't going to make any more money if she went the extra mile. But because we've taught people this, and we have people who... What, what we try to get into our people is we're here to help people, not to just be a big, well-known ministry. Every person that calls in here is somebody that God cares about. And I want every piece of mail that comes into this place answered in some way, shape, or form. And if we tell somebody we're going to pray for them, then I want them to be prayed for. And so, you know, there's a lot of stories I could get into, but I, this just one really blessed me. I'm stunned that you care enough to email me back. Well, God worked through that phone call in a miraculous way. Sarah gave her life to Christ. When we followed up again, email to celebrate her new life and provided links to everyday answers section on our website and other online resources she responded by saying I had been suicidal the night I felt compelled to click on your Facebook link to prayer 
I had my death all planned out. Then you emailed and you emailed again. For the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now see, the, the, here's the thing we've got to understand. You are around people all the time out in the world. You can reach people that the few of us on the platform can't reach. And most of the people who need Christ are not coming to church to find him. But they are looking at people who claim to know him. And love should be our main theme in the church. Above everything that you study and read on, you should study on love. Because when it all comes right down to it, that's really what we're called to do, is love God, love ourselves, and love other people. Not love yourself in a selfish, self-centered way, but love yourself because God loves you. Because if you're against yourself, you're not going to really show any love to other people. You cannot give away what you don't have. So to receive God's love means that you learn to accept and love yourself. And so she said, for the first time in my life, I felt loved. Now that's just sad, but the world is full of people like that. After talking to you, I, couldn't, I could not go through with the suicide I had planned. I was still confused and certain I would be aborting the baby, but after you sent scriptures, emailed again, and called, my world changed forever. This is cool. As I prayed on the phone to become a Christian, I felt what I can only describe as a blanket of peace in my room. I know that sounds crazy, but a heavy feather-like blanket descended on me. Then when the lady who called prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit, a cool breeze swept in through my room. I have no idea what it was, but literally a breeze came in and my hair was moved by the breeze. The windows weren't open and it's 95 degrees here, yet a breeze came over me with the blanket. It was as if God was with me in the room. Is that crazy? Question mark. Because I've never experienced anything like that before. Okay, so she couldn't have been making it up because she didn't even know what was happening. But these are the things, see, the Holy Spirit can move in miraculous ways if what we're doing is really being done out of love and with the right motivation. We have to stop living to impress people and really genuinely care about them. Well, she said, now I feel like I can live and my baby will live. You showered me with love and acceptance and honestly saved my life and my baby's life. Thank you so much. I ask that you'll continue to pray as I learn who I am and begin to be a mama. Joyce Meyer Ministries has since sent Sarah a Bible and we are providing her with tickets for the Love Life Women's Conference in September. In her last email, Sarah wrote, I'm so excited to get my very own Bible. I've never ever had one before. I'm reading the scriptures that you sent and I can't get enough of them. I'm even reading them to the baby too. Now I tell you that just as an example of what it means to go the extra mile. You see, if she didn't really care about those people contacting the ministry, then she would have just done what her job required and she would have gone no further. Like I said, she wasn't gonna make any more money for doing all that extra stuff. I wouldn't have even known what she did if somebody wouldn't have sent that in and then somebody by somebody by somebody by somebody got it to me. And I believe that God let me see that just to show me that we do have an excellent staff <clears throat> who genuinely care <clears throat> about people. <clears throat> you got some tree here that's called a choking tree and I think it's like, <clears throat> all right. So, what is strife? Strife is an angry undercurrent. It's bickering, arguing, heated disagreement, but you can have strife and nobody be yelling at somebody. And sad to say in many churches, there's strife underneath. People may come and listen to the pastor and then go eat him for lunch. Come on. The worship team sings pretty songs, but 
several of them think they have got a better voice than the worship leader and they should be leading the worship. And so they talk about the worship leader to other people. And I'll tell you what happens if something like that is not stopped. It'll end up killing the anointing on church. And you can put on the greatest show in the world, but if there's no anointing, nothing is going to happen in the people's lives. You know, you're not changed because we have a great media presentation and a light show. And my, my goodness, in my conferences, we have smoke machines. We've got it all. You know, it's like, whoo. But that's still not what changes people's lives. The only thing that changes life is God's anointing. And the only way we're going to have that is if we keep the strife out of our life, if we're people of integrity and people of excellence. Amen? Now, to be a person of integrity means that you're going to keep your word. Wow. Do we ever have a lot of that lacking today? I'll call you back in 30 minutes. Haven't heard back in six months. <laughs> hey, I'll call you next week and we'll go out to lunch. You don't even intend to call and you don't even want to go to lunch. <laughs> it's just something to say to sound nice. Well, when God first spoke these things to me, as I said, I wasn't... Uh, really educated in what any of them were. And so God had to teach me. I wasn't able to go to Bible college, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And honestly, I think that's the best one to go to. And I'll tell you what, God ran me through the ringer, so to speak. You say, well, what do you mean by that? God's a good God. Yes, he's a good God, and he's good enough to spank your little royal holy bottom if that's what he needs to do. Amen? And so God taught me a lot of lessons. One, I remember we were in Jacksonville, Florida, visiting a couple. I'd been preaching at their church, and, you know, we kind of hit it off with them. I still remember their names were, well, I better not say that. Cause, well, no, it won't go on TV here. <laughs> well, they might, you, you get everywhere, so they might hear it anyway, so I better not say their names. Uh, I'm getting wiser in my old age. <laughs> And so we'd had a good time. So when we got ready to leave, I said, hey, you guys ought to come to St. Louis sometime. And we'll spend a, several days or a week together. And we'll take you to see all the sights. You know, we'll go to the arch. We'll go to the zoo. Man, we'll go out to eat. We'll just have a great time. Well, to be honest, I didn't want them to come to St. Louis. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have time to spend a week with anybody. I barely knew what my name was. I was so busy back then trying to get the ministry started. I liked them, but I didn't like them that much that I wanted them to come <laughs> and stay with me that long. And so I didn't think anything about, hey, you guys come, you know, you know, you know how we are. I mean, you know how we are. And so about two weeks went by and the man called and he said, well, we're ready. <laughs> and I said, ready for what? He said, well, you know, to come to St. Louis, like you said. And I thought, oh, my God. What am I? What am I going to do? And so... When I pretended to be happy and hung the phone up, I said to God, what am I going to do? And he said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to bring them to St. Louis. And if you don't want to keep them in your house, you pay to put them in a nice hotel. And you spend the week with them. You take them wherever they want to go. You sightsee with them. You take them out to eat. And you will learn not to say things you don't mean anymore. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. 
because it really did teach me a lesson. Now, obviously, I didn't have to do what God said, but something else we're missing today that we need a lot more of is a reverential fear of God. I would venture to say that there's a fair number of people that have never heard a message on the reverential fear of God. I mean, I've, I've even had people say, well, I don't understand that. I thought, you know, God was good and he loved us and, you know, we've got grace and forgiveness. And I, don't, I don't understand what you mean. I don't think I should be afraid of God. I said, it's not that kind of fear. <laughs> It's a reverence. It's an awe for God that you know he's God and that he knows everything and can do everything and he sees everything. And see, everything we do when nobody's looking, God sees. I'm going to say that again because getting that revelation in your life will change your behavior. I mean, it honestly will. If, if we can realize that everything we do, God sees it. Come on, everything we do, <clears throat> God sees it. And if we can learn to live before an audience of one, realizing that we're here for His glory. And by the way, you know what the word glory means? It means the manifestation of all of the excellencies of God. So when we say, Lord, I glorify your name, what we're really saying is I behave with such excellence that I am making you famous. Amen? <laughs> People are watching us, and we need to realize that. No strife, be a person of integrity, be a person of excellence. The thing that frightens me today is we live now in times when one and maybe two are going on three generations are here on the earth who never grew up with these principles. They're not teaching them in school. <laughs> I mean, if when we were in school, when I was in school, if I would have done some of the things that kids do in school today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is <laughs> right. Yeah. But then, what do you expect from the kids if you've got a teacher cussing in the classroom? <clears throat> so, I, to be honest, we have a mess. And God is the only one <clears throat> that can unravel it. But we're partners with God, and He gives us a part to play. And I'm hoping that the message that I'm speaking here tonight will, in some way, shape, or form, convict every person here and all the other places that you're watching to come up higher in at least one area of your life. Just, just one area you're going to come up high. We're going to set the standard, not follow the standard. Several months ago on one of my conferences, I taught a version of the message that I'm teaching here tonight. And one of our speakers stayed to hear me speak, and he came to me afterwards and he said, now, I mean, this is a well-known speaker that's been in church all of his life, and he's a man that's probably close to 40, and he said, I have never in my life heard anything like that. And I just taught a pretty simple message on being a person of excellence. Gave a bunch of practical examples, which I'll do here tonight. And he said, can I come home and live with you for a while? <laughs> One of the reasons why I believe we do have a ministry of excellence is because we taught that to our children and our two sons are the two CEOs of the ministry. One of them runs the world missions and one runs all the other business aspects of the media and the operations and so on and so forth. Don't tell your kids one thing and then let them see you doing something else. Amen. 
<clears throat> don't tell them not to lie. And then when somebody calls that you don't want to talk to, tell your kids, tell them I'm not home. You say, oh, come on, I, I came here to hear something deep. Well, I'm sorry, this is about as deep as it gets, but it's deep enough to change your life if you're willing to go there. I think half the time we want to hear something that's so like over our head and sounds so amazing that we can just go out and say, wow. But we don't even know what we heard. Well, you'll remember this one. And so... How can somebody be in church 30 plus years and never hear a message on being excellent? I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. If God wouldn't have taught me these things, I honestly don't believe that I would be here today doing what I'm doing. In 1 Peter... 2 Peter 1, 3, <clears throat> the Bible says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us. <laughs> you want to know what your calling is? Here it comes. Who called us by and to his own glory and excellence. So we are called to be excellent. 1 Peter 2.9 says basically the same thing. There's a man in the Bible named Daniel that <clears throat> was an excellent man. In the very first chapter, the eighth verse, we see that he refuses to compromise. He'd made a vow to God about what he would and wouldn't eat, and they wanted him to eat all these rich, dainty foods. And he literally could have lost his life by refusing to eat those things. But he was willing to do even that rather than break his word to God. And so, God gave him favor. See, if you're willing to do the right thing, the devil is gonna try to make you afraid that you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose your friends, or something bad's gonna happen to you if you do the right thing. But the truth is, is no matter what the devil tries to do, if God decides to promote you, you're promoted. And if God gives you favor, you've got favor. And when you have the favor of God on your life, mm -mm, some good things begin to happen. And so Daniel also had excellent friends. You've heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not compromise, even if it meant their life. And the thing is, is who you hang out with is very important because if you're around somebody enough, what's on them is going to get off on you.
Amen? Amen. And some of you probably could change your life drastically just by getting a new group. I'll just leave that with you. Now, because I want this to be very practical, I'm going to get to some practical things. If you're not handicapped, don't park in a handicapped parking space. And especially don't do it at church. And I'll bet you that we've got people in here tonight that have pulled into this parking lot late, couldn't find a parking space, and you've pulled into a handicapped parking space. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because then you'd be tempted to lie and I don't want to be responsible for that. Well, they got too many of those handicapped parking spaces anyway. <laughs> if we'd stop making excuses for our disobedience and just call it what it is. By the way, I love you guys. There's so many scriptures that talk about this. If I had another two hours, we could go through every one of them, but the Bible, the Bible not only says to walk in love, it says to abound in walking in love. So even if you are a fairly loving person, we can't be content there. We have to always want to grow. We have to always want to be better. Paul said, excel in giving. And he was talking to people that were givers. But he said, excel and go on and do even more in this area. The more we do of what's right, the more happy and peaceful we're going to be and the greater reward is going to come in our lives. <clears throat> if you have a bumper sticker on your car, declaring that you're a Christian, please don't break the speed limit. <laughs> Roll your window down and throw trash out of it. And make nasty signs at people. <laughs> we won't explain that any further. When you use the last of the toilet paper on the roll, You're like, now you got to be kidding me, lady. I didn't, I did not come all the way over here and fight this traffic to hear you talk about toilet paper. Well, some of you need to hear this. Oh, the next person will get it. Well, but don't you hate it when you go into a bathroom? And there is no toilet paper on the roll. So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And listen, if you don't need this, I'll preach to myself because I need it. When I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I am so sleepy. And I realize that when I use the little bit of toilet paper on that roll, that there's going to be none left for Dave when he gets up. And because I love God, I replace the toilet paper. <laughs> See, instead of just telling God we love Him, we need to start acting like we do by being the kind of person He wants us to be. When you use a public restroom, do not tinkle all over the seat and not clean it up. There is nothing that annoys me worse. I have to use a lot of public restrooms because I travel a lot and I hate it when I go in. I have to go in four or five before I can find one clean enough to sit down on. Come on, is this okay? Yeah. 
don't let your dog go number two on your neighbor's yard and not clean it up. When you open your car door, don't throw it open and nick the paint. Hmm. You have an excellent attitude when the clerk at the store makes a mistake and has to go back and re-ring your 45 items. Do you treat her like she's valuable and act like you think Jesus would act? <laughs> or do you do what I used to do? <sighs> well, now I'm going to be late for my next appointment. With my rhinestone Jesus pen flash. <laughs> Now, God taught me a lot for some reason in the grocery store. I went to the grocery store about three times a week. My kids were all little then. and We were very, very tight on money. And so I clipped every coupon that I could find where I could get any kind of a deal. Well, you know, there's fine print on coupons, but interestingly enough, until I received the Holy Spirit... I didn't read the fine print, but when you get hooked up with God, He will lead you to the fine print. <laughs> How many of you know the fine print can get you in trouble? And so I noticed, because I, I loved it when chickens were on sale. And I, it said on the coupon, which I never noticed before, limit three per family. Not even three per person, three per family. Please. Well, I did not want three chickens. I wanted a bunch of free chickens. Not free, but cheap chickens. And so I would take my kids with me. And we'd all get three chickens and all get different carts and all get in different lines and pretend like we didn't know each other. Come on, is there anybody in the house that knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so one day I was standing there and I thought, I don't think I gave my daughter enough money for tax. And my heart started pounding in fear. Now, I'm teaching this, like, 25-person Bible study in my home. And God's teaching me how to be excellent, be a person of integrity, and so on and so forth. And so, he just said to me, don't you realize if you have to do this in fear, something's wrong with it? When I got through the checkout lane, he said, well, congratulations, Joyce, you just stole three chickens. <laughs> well, the first time, or one of the earlier times that I preached this message, I was in a church in Tennessee, and the pastor sat on the platform with me, you know, behind me. So he was behind me the whole time I was preaching, and I told that story that I just told. And he jumped up and pointed to his wife on the front row. And he said, you have turned me into a thief. <laughs> but he said, it wasn't chickens, it was toilet paper, and it was for the church. Step one, wake up early, gonna rise with the sun. Step two, get some good, some food in you. Step three, you grow hard about what you want to be. Step four, everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. 
Set your affirmations, aspirations I got shit to do, the aftermath of preparation Good food, good mood, blood in circulation One step at a time, yeah that's how you make it Set a goal you control and the steps you take them I try to pick one thought, have some concentration And if I make a mistake, it's called education I try to do this every day, call it replication Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. So life ain't easy, yo. I think there's a reason, though. Ups and downs, just like every different season, yo Sometimes I'm high, other times I'm barely breathing, though I always gotta fight and hide from the demons, yo Negative thoughts are poison, they ride, uh Head full of flaws, so here come the clouds, uh They'll never stop unless I can swap All the bad for the good in my head when I'm lost, uh yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it Positive thoughts are overtaken, I got patience One day at a time is how you operate a cadence A flow, you grow, you show yourself a foundation Stay away from all the shit that causes temptation I know that I like to do it cause of sensation I live my life in my head like a narration Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. Another thing God taught me was, you know, when you go in a grocery store, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff you really don't have to have is first. And then by the time you get over to the milk and the eggs and, you know, the stuff you really got to have, you've ran out of money, at least if you were like I was back then. I mean, I had to shop with my calculator and my coupons and I had exactly $70 for every two weeks for groceries. And... If I was going to be over that, I had to start putting stuff back. Well, until I really let God have full play in my life, whatever I didn't want, I would take out of the cart and just put it wherever I was at in the store. You know, I'm the person who put the lettuce in the cleanser. <laughs> Do you ever find items in strange places and think, what is that? What is that? It was me. And so then God started making me, and when I say making me, he didn't like force me, but I was committed to trying to learn to do what I felt like God really wanted me to do. So he would make me walk every item. You, you know how it is when, you, when the Holy Ghost is in you and you're really trying to be led by the Spirit? It's, you don't even have to have any words. It's like that look that your mother gives you. <laughs> and I finally learned it was better to just go do what he said than to have it nagging at me all day. Because sometimes God can be a nag. I mean, he would just keep it up and 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 keep it up. And if you don't pass that test, you will get to take it again. And then one last story, my grocery cart. I know that most of you have heard the grocery cart story, but you're just going to have to indulge me and let me tell it again. This is so amazing to me because, you know, I was one of those people, I didn't want to go put my grocery cart back in the space marked off for grocery carts. I wanted to lean it against a pole or prop it on the other carts that were out in the middle of nowhere and I would kick the wheels and you know try to get them so the thing wouldn't roll away 
and you'd start to walk off and it would start to roll so you'd go back. And... <laughs> Don't you love it when you come out of the store and there's two or three grocery carts leaned against your car and one of them scratched your paint? Well, it was people like me who did that. I didn't want it done to me. But I did it to other people. So God started dealing with me to go put the thing back where it was supposed to be. Well, they've got people that do that. Well, they're asking you to do it. Then it won't cost as much to run the store. <laughs> then the prices won't be so high. But here's the sad thing. <clears throat> it took me two years. Two years. Now, we're talking this is 40 years ago. I'm grateful I can say that. But... It took me two years to get to the point where I would go put it back every single time. I started out, I'd do it if the weather was good, if it wasn't raining, wasn't snowing, wasn't cold, the wind wasn't blowing. <laughs> Am I the only one who does these kind of things? Do I have anybody else out there that feels you've been kind of caught? And, and I can say this and mean it with my whole heart. I honestly believe if I would never have learned to put my grocery cart back where it was supposed to go, I don't think I'd be here today. That's how important it is that you hear what I'm saying tonight. We need to come up higher. And we need to be excellent people who represent the God that we say that we serve and love in a way that he deserves. Somebody give God a praise tonight. How many of you will know tomorrow afternoon what I preached on tonight? All right. Has anybody thought of a, at least one area where you could maybe make a little change? Well, then I think my job is done. Let me pray for you, and then Todd's going to come. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word tonight, so simple, but yet so powerful. I thank you for reminding me again of the kind of person you want me to be. And I pray, Lord, for everybody here that they heard and that they will obey. Lead and guide each person in what you would have them do to come up higher. And help them never forget how important it is. In Jesus' name.
Another thing that is very, very, very detrimental to people is how you feel about yourself. And I found this out many, many, many years ago, and it was so good when I did, but my main problem was I felt bad about myself. Because I'd been abused, I took the blame. There's gotta be something wrong with me. Why is it that when somebody don't like us, there's always gotta be something wrong with us? Why is it if a woman's married to a man that leaves her, there's gotta be something wrong with her? There must've been something wrong with me. Or, or if one of your kids turned out bad, well, there must've been something wrong with me. We need to stop just, I mean, there's enough stuff that we actually do without taking a bunch of false guilt and false blame on us all the time and letting the devil just load us down with a bunch of junk that's not even reality. It wasn't my fault my father abused me. It wasn't my fault that the first guy I married to was a first class jerk. I didn't make him the way he was. I didn't make my father the way he was. Amen? A lot of things even that we do wrong, we do wrong out of ignorance. You know, I'm sure that I wasn't a perfect mother, but really when I look back for the little I knew, I was actually pretty on top of it, you know? <laughs> I mean, wow, could I have done some nut ball stuff? <laughs> so I wanna tell you another little story in the Bible that has really helped me and I hope it helps somebody here tonight. You know, under the, under the Old Covenant, or under, back in the Old Testament, they made covenants with people, and it's kind of not like what we do today, you know. People giving you their word today doesn't mean too much anymore, but back then, boy, if you had a covenant with somebody, you kept it not only with them, but even to their children and even grandchildren after that. And so, David, who became the king, and Jonathan, who was Saul's son, the previous king, had a covenant relationship. And that basically means anything that's mine is yours, anything that's yours is mine, anything you need, you got it, I'll help you with anything. We need more covenant relationships. Don't you think so? And uh, so Saul was dead, Jonathan was dead, and David is remembering this covenant, and he still wants to bless somebody from Saul's and Jonathan's bloodline. So he went to his servant, I'm in 2 Samuel 9, <clears throat> and I'm reading in verse one, and David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I love that. I, I, I kind of look at it like this. It's like God looking around the room tonight and saying, is there anybody that I can show kindness to for Jesus' sake? See? For Jesus' sake. God's not good to us and kind to us because we deserve it. The relative that David was gonna bless, he'd, he'd, he'd never done anything. He wasn't e even in the covenant relationship. David just wanted to bless him for Jonathan's sake. And God wants to bless you for Jesus' sake. And sometimes all we gotta do is learn how to receive it. Just stop fighting him off. And so they told him about a boy named Mephibosheth, and they said, but he's crippled in both feet, and actually what happened was when they were running from the house, when they heard that Saul, I mean, that David had become king, they'd been lied about David, and they were running from the house, they fell down the steps with the boy, and he became crippled in both of his feet. And he was living out in a place called Lodibar, which meant without pasture, so it was not such a great place. And um, so he was told about this Mephibosheth, and so David ordered him to be brought to the palace. And when he, when he brought him in, verse six, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, behold, your servant. Now I thought about this a little bit today, and I don't know that I'm 100% right, but I'm just going to pretend like I am. And um, I always say it's my meeting. I can pretend I'm right if I want to. So 
You know, you almost look at that and you think that he bowed down in worship, but I'm not so sure part of it wasn't fear. I think he was uh, afraid. See, he knew whose grandson he was, and he understood covenant. He knew it extended to him. And if he wouldn't have been fearful, he would have already been knocking on the palace door long before that saying, I came to get what's mine. Amen. And not in any kind of an irreverent attitude, but when we, when we pray, that's kind of what you're doing. You're going to get what's yours, not because you've earned it or deserved it, but because Jesus has. Amen. That's why you don't need to beg God to do things for you that he already wants to do more than you even want to receive them. Who can I bless for Jesus' sake? And boy, I got a hold of that, and I'm like, here I am. Pour it on, God. I'll take all you want to give me. I know I don't deserve it, but if you're looking for somebody to bless, you -hoo. Here I am. And David said, well, yeah, I guess I must have been right, because David said, fear not. <laughs> Verse 7, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat always at my table. Now, watch verse 8. This shows the problem. And the cripple bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? <laughs> that was the image he had of himself. But if you don't really love yourself in a balanced way, then you're going to miss out on so many things that God has for you because you're always going to be shrinking back in fear from something or thinking that you don't deserve what God wants to give you. The more you like yourself, the more you're going to like other people. Amen? The more mercy that you receive from God, the more mercy you'll have to give away. We hope you enjoyed this teaching. To get more from Joyce, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing.
It's time to kick anxiety to the curb. Release it all with a night of girl talk and encouragement. Join us for a Love Life Girls Night in with Joyce, a live streaming event featuring worship with Katie and Brian Torwalt, a lively talk it out discussion with guest Love McPherson, and Joyce teaching us to tackle anxiety head on. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you start hearing is everything that you did wrong yesterday, it's not God. Friday, January 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Register today at joycemeyer.org slash live stream. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Are you doing something with your time that's fruitful, that's going to add to your life or add to the life of someone else? You don't have unlimited time. So don't live like you do, because someday all your time is going to be gone. So you want to use it wisely. Well, I am so glad that you have joined me today for enjoying everyday life. And I am excited about what I'm going to be teaching you today. And I think it's also going to go into tomorrow. I want to talk to you today about What are you doing with the resources that God has given you? It's something we all need to think about from time to time. You say, well, what are you talking about resources? Well, time is a resource, money, talents, abilities, and really even just life in general. So let me ask you, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your money? And what are you doing with the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that God has given you? When you get to the end of your life, are you going to be able to look back and not be disappointed, not have a lot of regrets? Or are you going to be able to say, I feel that I spent what God gave me well. I didn't waste it. I used it for his glory. This is so important for all of us to think about from time to time because there are so many things in the world that can distract us and pull us in wrong directions. And you only have one life to live and you only have one life to give. And we all need to think about what we're giving it to. So we're going to start today with John 6, 12, where Jesus had a huge crowd that had gathered to hear him teach. And it was getting past lunchtime. They were all getting hungry. And so he told the disciples to feed them. And, of course, they said, we don't have enough to feed this many people. And he took what a little boy had, and he multiplied it. And in John six twelve, it says, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. I love that scripture. Jesus does not approve of waste. He wants us to make use of what we have and not waste it. And you know, everything that we have, we're always spending. Like we spend time. I heard myself say one day, I feel like I'm spending I spend so much of my time trying to stay looking good. And then it just kind of rang back in my own ears. In my own ears, yes, I am spending my time. And every day that goes by is a day that we're not going to get back again. And so we can't kind of say, you know, on Tuesday, well, I think I wasted yesterday, so I'm going to rewind and do it over. Once we've used that time, we don't get it back. So We want to think a little bit about what we're doing and not just kind of be one of these people that get up every day and just kind of wait to see what happens. We want to have a plan, always be ready to change your plan if God wants to interrupt it, but have a plan for what you're going to do with your time. And when you you really think about it, between hair appointments, at least for me, hair appointments, hair color, cuts, styles, nail appointments, facials, exercise. I've now got a professional person stretching me to keep me limber 
as I age and keep so many things from hurting. All the daily maintenance that we do, you go to the dentist, you get your teeth cleaned, and then he wants you to floss, and he wants you to do this and that and something else. And, and then uh, you got to go to the eye doctor once a year, and I go to the ear doctor once a year and get my ears cleaned out and checked. And so there's a lot of things that we need to do to take care of ourselves, but that's not, you are spending time, but it's not a waste of time because the better you take care of yourself, the longer you're going to last and the better that you're going to feel. You know, no matter what age you are, let's say you're 20 or 30, you probably don't think that you'll ever be 60 or 70 or 80, but unless the Lord takes you home early, you will be. And I can tell you from experience, you want to make sure that when you are older, that you still feel good. And you can be if you spend some time taking care of yourself. You know, I said for years, I do not have time to exercise. But you know what I found out? Anything that you really want to do, if you want to do it strongly enough, you will make the time for it. If you want to know what's important to you, just look at what you're spending your time doing. We're always spending something. Time is a resource that God has given us. Some have more than others, but however much you've been given, once you've used it, you've used it, and you're not going to get it back. So I'm asking you today to really think about, when this program's over, I want you to think about what you're doing with your time. And are you putting it into what you want to put it into, or are you just letting circumstances dictate to you? Are you just spending three hours a day on Facebook just listening to all the gossip and maybe gossiping yourself? Or are you doing something with your time that's fruitful, that's going to add to your life or add to the life of someone else? You don't have unlimited time, so don't live like you do. Because someday all your time is going to be gone, so you want to use it wisely. Spending time. I think it's important that we take care of ourselves, that we look as good as we can. We represent God. And uh, so I recommend spending some of your time taking care of yourself, but God doesn't want us to waste our time. Every bit of time that we spend, we're doing one of two things, whether we're either wasting it or we're investing it. And when you invest, it always pays dividends in the long run. But if you waste, it's just gone and you get nothing from it. Have you ever thought of things like this? I'm spending too much time arguing with you. I'm spending too much time being angry and living in unforgiveness. I'm spending too much time on what I eat, how I fix it, where I buy it etc., etc. I'm constantly having to spend my time looking for things in my house that I put somewhere and can't remember where I put them. Every single day, there's very few days that go by that I don't have to go looking for my phone. It's kind of become like a joke between Dave and I because I'll have to have him call my phone so I can find it. It's amazing the places that we can leave our phone one day I finally found mine in my makeup bag in my drawer. We can leave them in so many weird places and waste time trying to find them then. Or have you ever thought, man, we have so much stuff. How many of you have too much stuff? Well, you know, everything you bring in your house is something that you then have to take care of or you have to dust. If you have got 150 trinkets sitting all over your house, those are things that you have to dust. Maybe it's time for you to do a de-junking session. Just get yourself a big box and go through your house and maybe clean out some things that aren't really that important to you anymore. Sometimes we get so much stuff in our house that we end up not seeing anything. You don't even see the things that you really like because people give you things you don't want to throw them away, so you put them somewhere and then you see something on sale and you buy that and you put it somewhere and so just be careful how much stuff you have. Maybe it's time to make some changes. Spend your time wisely. 
don't waste it. If somebody lies on the couch for three hours every day watching soap operas, that's a waste of time. It's a total waste of time. But if you do spend your time, say, say you take a one hour walk, that's time invested because that's gonna help you help your health, it's gonna help your bones, it's gonna help you stay healthy longer. I'm not saying that all television is wrong. I enjoy watching TV in the evenings, but I am saying that we can watch something that's a total waste of time, or we can watch something that is beneficial. I like good documentaries. I learn things from them. Lately, I've been trying to watch funny movies because I love to laugh. And the Bible says, laughter doeth good like a medicine. It's good for us. So be picky and choosy about what you put on the inside of you, because once it's in there, it's not all that easy to get it out. Take an inventory of the resources that God has given you. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to be born and a time to die, and it goes on and on and on that there is a time for everything. Each one of us has an allotted amount of time, and in Ephesians 5.16, it says, redeem the time. Use your time wisely. What does it mean to redeem the time? It means to take it and use it wisely. Now, let me just stop for just a second and ask you, do you believe that you are using your time wisely? I know God has me teaching this today for somebody that's watching, for all of you that are watching. And it's even good for me studying it because we can get off track in this area so easily. The Bible says in, in Colossians 4.15, behave yourselves wisely, live prudently and with discretion in your relations with those of the outside world, the non-Christians, making the very most of your time and seizing, buying up the opportunity. You know, if you're a born-again Christian, Jesus is your Savior. He wants to use you to expand his kingdom. And you have to keep in mind that people, many multiplied millions of people, are looking for something. Some of them don't even know what they're looking for. But you may be the only Jesus that they will ever see. Now, obviously, you're not Jesus, I'm not Jesus, but we are his personal representatives in the earth. And it is important that we do something other than just go sit in a church once a week and think that's all there is to it. We need to get out in the world and we need to represent him and we need to represent him well. When you go to work, don't sit at the lunch table and just listen to all the gossip and gossip yourself or listen to dirty jokes or just things that are just totally a waste of time. You'd be better off to eat by yourself and read a good book or something rather than to do that. And it's not even really a good witness when you do that because if you say that you are a Christian, people really expect you to live like one and sometimes they'll test you just to see if you're going to or not. Before my husband came into full-time ministry with me, he worked in the engineering field and he said there were times when people would come and tell him dirty jokes and he said I could tell they were just testing me to see what I would do. And he told me one time, he said to a guy, he said, you know, I don't want to hear that. So why do you even bother coming around and telling me? Well, you know, sometimes we don't like to say things like that. We don't want to be embarrassed or we don't want to embarrass the other person. But you know the interesting thing? Dave stood up for what he believed in and you know what the result was? When these people had problems in their lives, when they had marriage problems, when they got sick, they always came to him and asked him for advice or asked him for prayer. But if you want people to believe that God is actually real and that he does really make a real difference in your life, then you have to behave in such a way that they believe that. Please, please, please don't just go to church on Sunday and then act like everybody else the rest of the week. Don't act like you think you're better than they are, but you have a moral standard to keep and you need to make sure that you do that and not just act like everybody else because you don't want people to think you're a Jesus freak or that you're weird. Use your time wisely. 
especially with those in the outside world. Make sure that you represent God the way that he should be represented. Don't let yourself behave badly and give a bad witness. It could be your only opportunity to show Jesus to that person. If God throws a door wide open for you to witness to somebody, don't be afraid to do it. Sometimes we witness with our words. Sometimes we just witness with our life and our behavior. You don't need to feel pressured to feel like you need to preach to every unbeliever that you come across. Sometimes God just wants you to pray. It's very important that he prepares their heart, that their heart is open to hear what you have to say. But I believe many times that the loudest sermons that we preach are with our behavior rather than our words. There's a saying that I think goes like this, preach at all times and if necessary, use words. I really believe that we preach more with our lives than we ever do with our words. Matter of fact, if you tell people what to do and then don't do it yourself, it's actually worse than if you would just keep your mouth shut to begin with. You know, there are opportunities that God gives us that if we don't take them, they don't pass us by again. It's important to be obedient to God and to listen to what he puts in your heart and to take those steps of faith to step out and do what he wants you to. When God wants something done, if he has to go through a thousand different people, now listen to me, if God wants something done, if he has to go through a thousand different people, he will find somebody that will do his will. Well, why not let it be you? Don't lose opportunities that God gives you. Don't waste those opportunities that he gives you. You know, Esther is a woman in the Bible that was a young woman. I'm sure she had plans for her life and she wasn't expecting those plans to be interrupted suddenly without notice from God. But her people, the Jewish people, were in danger of being killed because of a wicked man named Haman who hated Jews. And so Esther's uncle asked her to go into the king's harem and try to gain favor with the king and to eventually go before him and plead for her people. Well, she was afraid to do that. She didn't know what would happen to her. First of all, you didn't go before the king unless you were called. And if you did go before the king and you weren't called, if he didn't hold out his golden scepter to you, you would be killed. But here's what her uncle said to her. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. As I said, God will always find somebody to do what he wants them to do. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. You know, I personally believe that all of us are born in a particular time in all the history of time for a reason. We're living in very difficult times in the earth right now. And maybe you think sometimes I wish I would have been born at a different time. You know, I think about when I was a teenager, how much better the world was than it is today. I mean, unbelievers then were nicer than some believers are now. We have lost so much ground. So, so many people don't even know what excellence is anymore. They don't know what integrity is. People don't keep their word. It's, it's like there's, the world is so full of hatred and strife and so many people are in unforgiveness. And, but I believe that we were called for such a time as this. I don't believe that you're here by accident during this time frame in life, and I don't believe that I am either. But I don't believe that God just wants us to waste our life or waste our time. I think we're here for a reason, and I believe that if you haven't done it before, it's time for you to start asking God what that reason is. You know, God doesn't look for ability. He just looks for availability. And all you have to do is simply say to God, God, I'm here. I'm yours. If you want me, if you want to use me for anything, just let me know what it is, and I'll try to do it to the best of my ability. And you know, if you say that to God and you really mean it, it won't be long and God will find something for you to do. The harvest is ripe, and the Bible says pray that the Lord would send out laborers into the harvest. 
And I have recently really begun to pray that prayer on a daily basis because it's very true. We need people that will really work for the Lord. And you don't have to have a reverend in front of your name to do that. You don't have to have a pulpit to do that. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Ephesians that he only gives the five-fold ministry to train up the body of Christ that they might go out and do the work of the ministry. My job is not to do all the ministry. It's to help train you to do your part. And really, to be honest, most people that need Jesus are not going to go to church to find him. Some will, but you can do more in your little corner of the world if everybody got out in the world, everybody that's a Christian got out in the world and just did their part, you could do more than all the preachers in the world. Let God use you. Let him use you where you're at. And don't waste your time. What are you doing to help somebody else? That's a question that I like to ask people, and I like to ask that of myself. Every day I pray that God would let me help somebody, that I could put a smile on somebody's face, or that I could encourage them or lift them up or that I could give something to them that will make them happy. You know, don't use the things that you have. Don't use people to get things. Use the things you have to be a blessing to people. God gives us all resources. And you know, everything that you own is not really something that you own. God owns it and you're a steward of it. And he expects us to steward what he gives us wisely. There's so many great things that the Bible has to say about this. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. Well, what does that mean? I think it means exactly what I'm talking about today. Think about what you're doing with your life. Think about what you're doing with your time. And you know, I really feel in my heart that this is a simple message, but an important message and it's one that I don't think that people think about enough. Let me ask you a question. Are you just using all your time to entertain yourself? Are you using all your time just trying to get what you want out of life? Or have you come to the point yet where Paul was, where he said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me in the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Are you ready to actually offer yourself to God for his use? And if you've not received Jesus as your Savior yet, it's very simple to do. All you have to do is admit that you're a sinner. Tell God you're sorry for your sins, you're sorry for the way you've lived, and that you want to be a Christian, you want to be a follower of Christ. Invite Him to come into your life. Start learning the Word of God. Begin to follow it and follow the Holy Spirit. And do the things that God wants you to do. Don't live in the darkness anymore. It's time to come out of the darkness and live in the light. And then another resource that we have is money. I know most of you probably think you don't have enough, but what are you doing with what you have? Some people will never have more than what they have because they're wasting what they do have. Oh, there's so many things to waste money on today. How many things do you have in your house that you bought when it was on sale or you bought because it sparkled or it shined or you thought it was pretty and you took it home and you put it in a drawer and you don't even know where it's at now? You've never used it. We have so much abundance in this country. We waste more in America than most people in other countries even have. And sometimes we're not even all that thankful for what we do have. I was in India one time and I was actually visiting a leper colony. We were feeding them and just trying to encourage them. And I remember one of the lepers, he came to me and he wanted me to come and see his home. Well, I didn't know what I was going to see, but I certainly was shocked by what he called his home. When he got me to the place, it was just basically a hole that was dug out of the side of a hill. And it was tall enough to walk into. And what he had in, in that hole was dirt walls, dirt floor. He had a hammock in there that was his bed. And over in one corner, there were a couple of metal pots that had dents in them and a metal plate, and he was so excited about his home. He was more thankful for that hole in the side of the hill 
than most of us are for the beautiful houses and homes that we have here in our country. We need to learn to not waste our money, but to use it to help other people and to use it, at least some of it, to help preach the gospel. My husband has a great saying, and we taught this to all of our kids and we're teaching it to our grandchildren. Dave just came up with this great plan for finances one day. He said, save some, spend some, and give some. Out of everything that you get, save a little for your future because someday you're going to need it. Don't just depend on Social Security. You don't even know what will happen to that by the time you need it. Save some. It's wise to save some. Spend some. By the time you work hard all week, you want to spend a little money on yourself. You want to get yourself something that you need or want, and that's fine. And give some. Always give a portion of what you get to people who have less than what you have. Don't waste your money on frivolous things that aren't going to do any good. But really think about what you're doing with your money. Have a plan for your money and make it a wise plan. Now, we're going to continue this teaching tomorrow because I still have some other things that I want to talk to you about, about waste. But remember, Jesus said, gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. He is not in favor of waste. And I always say, if you're going to expect money, you need to respect money. And so no matter how much money you have, you may be the richest person on the face of the earth, but you still don't have any right to waste your money. Today, we're offering you a book that I've written called Seize the Day. This is the day the Lord has made. Use it wisely. It's a very good book. And we're offering it to you today for your gift to the ministry, your financial gift of any amount. And we will use your money to help people like that leper who lived in a hole dug out of the side of a hill, to rescue victims of sex trafficking, to feed the hungry, to build schools, and to help people all over the world. And you're going to enjoy the book. I think it will make a difference in your life. Thank you for being with us today. And remember to tune in tomorrow when we're going to continue this teaching on not being wasteful. God bless you and have a great rest of the day. It's time to kick anxiety to the curb. Release it all with a night of girl talk and encouragement. Join us for a Love Life Girls Night in with Joyce, a live streaming event featuring worship with Katie and Brian Torwalt, a lively talk it out discussion with guest Love McPherson, and Joyce teaching us to tackle anxiety head on. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you start hearing is everything that you did wrong yesterday, it's not God. Friday, January 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Register today at joycemeyer.org slash live stream. In our world today, there's an epidemic of anxiety. There's so much coming against us, and for many, it's causing not just worry, but an overwhelming and frightening state of panic. There are keys to dealing with this, and I want to help you use God's Word to fight and win the battle for inner peace. My book, The Answer to Anxiety, will help you through the process of eliminating tormenting thoughts and replacing them with the peace that passes all understanding. Joyce Meyer's The Answer to Anxiety. Order now. Get your daily dose of encouragement with the Joyce Meyer Ministries app. Catch up on seven days of enjoying everyday life episodes. Grow deeper in God's Word with the daily devotional and question of the day. And enjoy all your favorite teachings from Joyce in your digital library. Find all this and more with the Joyce Meyer Ministries app. Search Joyce Meyer in your app store and download it today. We hope you enjoyed today's program. For more information, visit JoyceMeyer.org. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.